So thanks again, everyone, for for, um, for showing up for our, our webinar tonight. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the journey that we've been making between Venture 1.0 um, to Venture 2.0 to Venture 3.0, and talk a little bit about what those terminologies mean and what role data plays um, in that kind of evolution of what we're all doing in Venture. I saw a number of familiar names in the chat room, so I can see that there's quite a few folks um, that, that are listing in here that, that, uh, that do know a lot about venture capital. Um, uh, what we're looking for here or what we're looking to explain here is really an evolution. Um, it's not a replacement of, of human reasoning. It's not a replacement for anything that we're already doing that's right. What we're looking to do is advance a few more concepts here that can, can help us get better at, at what we do. Um, just a little bit on, on our history as Hatcher. We started out as a very normal VC fund, I'd say. Um, we were really an idea, ideation lab uh, based in Singapore. Uh, we created 15 companies, uh, made 20 investments into those companies, and we've turned successfully $20 million into 42. We've got a gross IRR of 22.5 right now. We'll, that we'll end up uh, putting an extra five points on that, we think, within the next um, couple of years. So good result. Um, Hatcher 2 is a, is a, or H2 is a fund that we started in 2018. Um, and we've already made a, a number of investments. This, this number here is a bit old, actually. We're sitting with 134 um, investments in our, in our portfolio at the moment. But what I wanted to talk about was really the kind of thinking that, that got us to H2. And the core idea behind, um, behind this fund was, can we generate consistent returns from venture? And the thing that drove this was, it's not so long ago that our returns from our first fund were sitting on an IRR of single digits. And and it wasn't looking great. It's gotten a lot better since, but but the, the general ride that you go through in venture, it can be quite exciting and, and a, a little bit nerve wracking uh, because generally venture does have this huge sort of random component to it where, where you know, one fund can do incredibly well and right next to it in the same building is a fund um, that's sitting in the same city and not doing as, as well. So we wanted to really ask the, the core questions and, and get an understanding of what works um, in venture capital. And so that's kind of where we started. Um, I'm lucky enough to, to have a co-founder who's one of the um, most respected data scientists in, in the planet, Dan Hookterp. Um, Dan was uh, the founder of SageMaker Retrieval Technologies in the 90s, which did a lot of early work in data retrieval and AI. Uh, then he went on to be CIO at Bankrate, CIO at, at Bankrate um, which I think uh, at the time they IPO'd in 2007 was Google's third largest advertiser. Um, a lot of what Dan was doing at Bankrate was based on algorithmic uh, methodologies of connecting lenders and borrowers. Um, so when I wanted to create a data-driven approach to venture, Dan was literally the first person I called, and I was just lucky enough to engage with him at a time when he was looking to also start doing something in venture. So we teamed up together. Um, what the two of us did is we went on to to procure a lot of data and start cleaning that up. That took a, over a, a good part of the first year, actually. Um, we ended up with a database of about 600,000 venture transactions. And from that, we've created uh, 4 billion virtual VC portfolios, which sounds like a very large number, and it is. And what this means is we've created a fintech in Jakarta times 20 company portfolio. We've created ad tech in Berlin times 50 companies portfolio. We've created med tech globally, early stage times 2,000 companies. And what we've done is study all of the outcomes of those portfolios using artificial intelligence. And we've found some super interesting things that I wanna share with you tonight. Um, the first thing is no surprise to the VCs on this call, the angel investors, um, venture returns don't follow a normal distribution curve. They, they follow what, to, what we would call power curve characteristics. And, and a power curve simply means that the one investment in your 100 investment portfolio is probably going to be responsible for a huge um, percentage of your returns. And a power curve effect you can see here down on the bottom right, it, it's when you, you end up with a couple of unicorns in your portfolio, really returning everything about that portfolio. It's what people focus on for the next 10 years when they're talking about that fund. Um, we thought it'd be interesting to figure out how often they occur. And we discovered that these power curves occur roughly one every 100 seed stage companies. Um, we came out with this study, and then within a couple of weeks of, of this, CB Insights did a very similar study um, and also found that the rate of unicorns um, appearing from seed stage was around about the same number. 
Um, we were quite fascinated. So what this means basically is if you have a thousand investments in your portfolio, 10 of those will go on to become a, a unicorn. Um, if you have a hundred investments, one will go on to become a unicorn. I'll talk a bit about the likelihood of one investment out of five becoming a unicorn. It does happen, um, but it, it doesn't happen statistically very often. Um, what we also decided to do was, discuss, it was look at selection ratios. And by selection ratios, what I mean there is, is what are the odds that a company gets any funding at all and becomes a seed stage company? Um, and what we discovered is, is the odds. And we did this research with the National University of Singapore. And we discovered that the odds of a startup um, getting investment at seed stage is roughly 1%. For every 100 business plans that a VC sees, they'll pass on 99 of them and they'll select one. Um, for investment. One will make it through the investment committee. So you can very now easily calculate the odds of, of a single business plan going on to become a unicorn. And those odds are one in 10,000. And, and while that sounds daunting, it's not quite as daunting as you, as you might imagine. But the great thing about having that number is you can now build a portfolio um, that is going to have a level of predictability about it. Uh, and when we first came out with these numbers three years ago, we were kind of alone talking about this at conferences. And it was very, very hard to get traction with these ideas because there were very few people that had discovered the same things. Since then, everything's changed. Um, Google Ventures, ourselves, INSEAD, Harvard Business Review, AngelList. There's a, a large number of people now that have, have discovered or proven that 500 or more investments in a portfolio does lead to stronger, more predictable returns. And you can see it on the right-hand side here. Um, this little graph here, I really like um, the one that's inset here because what it shows, if you have basically a 100 company um, portfolio, you're going to get a 2x return. If you have a 2000 company portfolio, you're going to get a 4x return. Um, and people say, is, is it really as simple as that? And it actually is. When we ran all of our 4 billion simulations, this was the thing that kept popping up was the fact that if you have a larger portfolio, you'll capture more unicorns in that portfolio and your results will be better. Now, that's not to say that it's not possible to, for one person to make a single investment in Gojek or Grab and, and go to the moon with that investment. That's certainly possible. But again, it's just not statistically reliable as a strategy. And what we wanted to find was a statistically reliable approach to venture in the same way that people have been building mutual funds and, 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 and dark pools now for 20, 30 years, we wanted to find the venture version of that and we found it. And so the secret here is that we with H2 are building a, a, a portfolio of 1,350 companies. We would expect in that portfolio to get around 13 unicorns. If you study the returns of 500 startups and um, Y Combinator, you'll find that al almost exactly they've created 1% unicorns out of their portfolios. It's fascinating how, how closely the empirical data tracks to our simulations. The other thing we wanted to look at from the data was where to invest. And this is this is a real conversation start of this chart because if, you, if you're out to dinner and you ask a bunch of people where you should invest in venture, the kind of, the kind of answers you're gonna get are people will say, oh, you should invest in series B or series C or late stage because it's less risky. But if you look at this chart here, which tracks basically formation, pre-seed, seed, series A, series B, series uh, C, series D, series E, what you can see here is, is that the returns are good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with those returns, but they're less than you're likely to get if you invest in the NASDAQ. Whereas if you invest in formation stage companies or pre-seed or seed or series A, um, there's a very good chance that you'll outdo the NASDAQ. And that's what venture is about. Venture exists. Um, to provide better returns than, than, than public equity strategies. Um, that's why people do venture. And so what this says to us is that if you're going to do venture, um, the early stage valuations are, are undervalued relative to the risk. So it, what you should be doing is putting more money at an earlier stage. And the great thing about that is if you look at recent IPOs for Airbnb and DoorDash and Coinbase, you can see some unbelievable multiples if you invest early. I think uh, Union Square Ventures in New York got a 1,000x multiple on their Coinbase investment at Series A. Uh, the earliest DoorDash investors got 600. I, I think they also got a 1,000x. Airbnb, 620x. You only get those multiples really if you invest early stage. At later stage, you're going to get 
one, two, three X. You, you're not. You're rarely going to see these really big, um, really big multiples. So for us, um, seed is a really interesting thing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about seed to IPO strategies in a few minutes because this is an emerging trend that we see several people um, jumping into now, where people start investing pre-seed and seed, and then keep investing all the way to IPO. It's a really fascinating strategy. And by the way, on that approach. I don't think any of us VCs are going to be introducing ourselves as a Series A VC or a seed VC um, in the future because I think these seed to IPO strategies are going to become more and more prevalent. And that's what the data shows as well. Um, if you want to build a really, really big portfolio, then you've got to do a lot of deal scouting. Um, we have built a really amazing deal scouting engine. It, it's powered by AI. And it's, it's real AI. It, it, it does a lot of really, really useful work for us and our, our co-investment partners. Um, we offer the, um, the deal sourcing and analysis piece for free um, to any VC or angel group that wants to use it. And we're powering now an increasing number of angel groups around the, the world. Um, having the ability to reach out and find deals through a, through a really big network, we call it our vast network, our Venture as a Service Technology Network, really gives us the ability to see that top 1% of deals and, and to invest at a very uh, a very high level and with, with great confidence in the quality of the investments. So the whole game here that we're playing is we want to aggregate pro rata rights at the pre-seed and seed level. Um, so to illustrate that more graphically here, um, we invest at formation seed and series A um, then we transfer those pro rata rights to later stage investors that have more money than us or want to write bigger checks than us. So we're really super interested in the early stage stuff. Um, a lot of people that we meet and that we work with are super interested in later stage um, stuff. They want to put $20 million into a company. We want to put $100,000 into a company. Now, if you're putting $100,000 into a company, you need to have a ton of automation working for you. Otherwise, you can't do it. You just need too many staff. It's too expensive. So what we've done is we've created a massive amount of automation um, that enables us to do five or 10 investments in a day if we need to. And uh, that's the rate of, we, we're investing at a, at a rate of about of an investment today before COVID shut down uh, some of our uh, or, or many of our deal origination partners. They're coming back online now, but what we've proven during that exercise is that it is possible to do high momentum um, investing and that's super important. So I want to end by talking a little bit about Venture 3.0. Um, it's real simple. Going forward, everything's going to be different. And let's just talk a, briefly about 1.0 and 2.0. So 1.0 was kind of like, a, it, it's a boys club. Let's face it. It was a bunch of guys. There is a woman in this picture I'm very happy to see, being that it's 1959 and computers still had brown screens. Um, the earliest investment for 20 years was just VCs. And VCs pretty much owned the show and, and, and made these investments. And then uh, interesting things started happening in the early to late 80s. And, and basically everyone started becoming an investor, particularly the, the uh, angel groups. And at this point, a lot of people were convincing themselves that it's possible to do a full court basket from the other end of the court, you know, a, a number of times. Anyone that's ever tried that knows that it's statistically unlikely uh, we've run the math across 600,000 deals and, and 4 billion simulations, and we know how often it happens, and it happens one in 10,000 business plans, one in 100 seed stage investors uh, investments. So with that in mind, I wanted to talk just briefly about what we see as Venture 3.0. Um, we see it basically consisting of four components, data-driven mega portfolios, really, really large portfolios, um, why are they large? Because that delivers more consistent returns. And we're not the only people that have figured this out. AI-powered deal scouting, you can't build large portfolios or high-quality portfolios without having a really, really amazing network, um, great deal flow, and AI to figure out you know, what you should be investing in and what is a match for your mandate. C to IPO strategies, if you look at what Tiger Global is doing, they're doing an amazingly intelligent strategy, I think. Um, Andreas and Horowitz just put $400 million to work around the same strategy. SoftBank's been doing this for years. So C2 IPO, we think, is going to be not just an emerging trend, but it will become a prevalent trend in the next few years. Pro rata rights aggregation is what that's all about. I used to say pro rata rights weaponization on this um, PowerPoint, and I was told that that was a bit too aggressive, but 
I don't think it really is because if you're doing a seed to IPO strategy, using data, building a massive portfolio, and you're using massive amounts of automation, um, you really are setting yourself up to be quite successful. And you're also setting yourself up to be quite dominant relative to other people that might be playing around the edges of that, that strategy. So if I was to sum up where we see success um, coming for venture investors in the next few years, we think it's going to be models like Hatcher. And we think that investors that successfully combine a whole bunch of capital with AI-powered deal scouting, global deal origination, robotic business process automation, everything that we've just talked about, these guys are going to own deal flow in the next 10 years. They're going to be able to move faster. They're going to be able to create bigger portfolios. And on the basis of that, they'll probably be more consistently successful. So this is why we're following this strategy. As I mentioned, we're not the only folks out there that are doing it. Um, if you'd like to partner with us and use our technology, please give us a call. Um, we, we, we love sharing our technology and we love, love it when other people um, use it. So I'm going to sign off there. I think we're going to answer a few questions now, right, Grace? Is that, uh, is, is that the idea? Yeah, uh, sure. Thank you so much, John, for a very insightful presentation. I believe uh, we have uh, lots of questions already um, lining up, but maybe if um, I may excuse myself, um, I also have some couple of questions for That's you, right. um, maybe to kind of, um, you know, have more um, discussions um, before uh, we get more questions lining up, um, if that's all right. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, what is really interesting from uh, your uh, presentation is that you mentioned um, this, this difference is between venture 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0, where we're more data-driven and everything. But then uh, people also say that investment is an art, right? Especially um, when early-stage companies uh, usually have lesser amount of data, whereas your AI um, solution actually depends on data. Uh, so, and also maybe to add some more, uh, according to uh, my experience, and also uh, I believe both of the early stage investors, um, as also what I've heard is that mostly we're investing on the founders or and the business solution, the vision and everything. So I just want to know your view on that. How do you think AI can capture all that? And um, yeah, just your, your response towards, um, you know, this investment is an art uh, with lesser data, how will AI still um, deliver that kind of return that you just uh, mentioned before? Yeah, so, so I actually wrote a blog on this that's available at hatcher.com. And, and, uh, and the reason I wrote the blog is that, that, that there's, there's, there's a lot of noise around AI in the marketplace, right, and on television and, and everywhere. And, and what I wanted to point out in the blog is quite simply that there are some very appropriate places to use AI, and there's some places where it just doesn't work at all. Um, I think, let me say, first of all, as an investor, I absolutely want to eyeball the founder. I want to hear about how they're changing the world. I want to hear their vision for, for what, what they're building, and, and that's always going to be part of, of what we do. What I don't want to do, though, is I don't want to spend 80% of my time looking at uninteresting ideas that and not at the stage that I want and not in the sector I want or not in the location I want. And so what our AI is super good at is figuring out what kind of deal is a match for my mandate as an investor. Um, what it's also good at is compiling all the relevant information, making sure none of it's duplicative and, and, and just doing a job of pulling all that stuff together. What it's also excellent at is, is, there's a lot of bias that comes into play when analysts in particular look at deals and partners. And so if a deal comes in and it's a deal from an older guy like me or from a woman or from someone who doesn't speak uh, uh, English or whatever, those biases can very, very quickly, um, they, they can come into play subconsciously. And the great thing about AI is the AI looks at the business opportunity. It looks at the match for those mandates and it doesn't care if you're old or young or, or male or female or what race you are, what religion you are. And that's one of the stunningly positive things I find about AI. So it does level the playing field. It does get rid of the things that aren't a match for your, uh, for your, your investment mandate. And it does, I think, give you more time to actually do your art you know, as an investor, to, to practice what you've learned over years of experience 
because now you're going to be focused on the deals that really matter and the ones that are a much better match for you. So I think it's a place for both things and there'll always be a place for, for both the art and, and the science. Agree, agree on that. I mean, at the end of the day, when, um, as you also mentioned, going for a large number of portfolio companies will take so much time for for the for the artists in a way the investors who invest as like an art so it's also do us a lot of um yeah deal scouting with ai will, will definitely be a huge advantage to um, the human side of investing i would imagine yeah and and to take up your point about founders as well i mean we've all seen instances where a terrific team comes in with one idea and then six months they pivot and they're going to exactly an opposite idea. We saw several of our portfolio companies during COVID pivot away from being, we saw one pivot from a travel company to being a, an office assistant company. They had a technology developed a bit like Slack that they developed internally, terrific technology. And now they're off in a completely different direction. So a lot, what a lot of the time uh, the AI cannot tell you is what that pivot's going to be. The AI is pretty bad at predicting the future. It's great at looking at what you have right now. And so it's, it is so incredibly important to pick to, to fund and back good people because you need those people to be able to turn on a dime when faced with something like COVID and reinvent their businesses and do all the things that humans do that AI can't do yet. Agree, agree. And also, uh, since you've also touched um, on some points on um, diversity of founders, and I believe because you also have gathered all this data, maybe if you could share some insights of some trends you've seen on on the on the fundraising side, on the investor side, if we do see a certain trends um, towards uh, women founder, for example, or certain verticals, or um, which is actually in a hot hotter space at this point. Um, yeah, maybe some insightful trends about that. Yeah, I'd love love to talk about that. I mean, it's a uh, it, it's definitely a topic I'm super interested in. Uh, because it's come up quite often in the last 20 years, right? You know, why aren't there more women in computer science? Why aren't there more women working at Facebook or Google? And, and what's fascinating is when you match the graduation rates of women from computer science courses, they almost exactly match the number of women working at, at, um, at Silicon Valley companies. So I think that's, you know, that's, that's just a, a something that, that it is what it is, right? X number of women are studying computer science, X number of women are working at, at companies that require a computer science degree. What I find far more interesting is what the trending, it, the, the kind of trending that's happening at the moment that I think is going to benefit um, women in, in the future. Um, so we've examined the, 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 the application rates that we get from women and men, and we found that the ap application rates for, for any kind of funding um, through and we've had 26,000 applications come through in, in the last 18 months. Um, they they still favour males, 80% to 20%. Um, so so that's that's there's nothing in our website um, or any of our partners' websites that says you know don't apply if if you're a woman. That's just a raw piece of data that seems to indicate that that men are four more four times more likely to to apply for funding. The other thing, if you look at recent SPACs, um, less than 10% of the SPACs initiated was, were initiated by women. So something's going on um, that still favours men. And, and maybe this is something that's unsolvable. But I, I want to paint a bit of a, 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 um, a positive picture here. Uh, one of the things I blogged about quite recently is if you look at what women have been studying for the last 10 to 15 to 20 years, what's happened is a lot more women than men have gone into a wetware kind of sciences like you know, bioscience, life sciences, um, health tech, um, healthcare generally, education. And if you look at the kind of investments that are going to be trending over the next 10 years, we're entering the golden era um, of, of bioscience and, and human computer interfaces, and all of these things, psychology and how that is going to, to, to also come online. So women are actually far better prepared for the coming 10 years than men um, at, at, on a statistical level. They, they have chosen the right subjects to study over the last 10 or 15 years, and, and they are very, very much prepared for the next 10 years. So watch out, men, would be my advice, because I think women are in for a very, very interesting decade indeed. And anyone that did computer science at school <clears throat> needs to have a, a close look at Signal and the other automatic 
coding things at the moment if they if they've got a, got a lot they need to stay ahead of right mm-hmm. now so I think women have made doubly good choices right by not going into <laughs> by focusing on on life sciences and biotech yeah I think so it's it's more towards um the the industry itself uh, which is booming what what we what we need in the world and also at the same time women responding to that demand in a way and making this uh, women entrepreneurial space yep. uh, even more prevalent um, I guess that's also something interesting. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I am seeing a lot more women at, at, at um, in 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 uh, in sort of a startup um, competition settings. Um, yeah, there are more applications coming in than before. What I find quite fascinating is Asia um, and the Middle East are, are, are places that where there's not enough good press about what's going on with female entrepreneurs because there's a lot of them. Um, so I, I think I see very positive trends happening here, and uh, and yeah, let's hope it continues, and let's hope those those get rich and then go on to become part of the venture capital funding world, right? And the funding ecosystem, because that's how it's going to happen is within 10 years, there'll be a whole host of new partners and a lot of them will be women. Agree, agree. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Uh, uh, We actually have some questions from uh, our audience here. Um, so first question, uh, in addition to art, sometimes the golden recipe to come into the deals earlier or to find, um, or to find a hidden gem while with AI, we expect more data available. Will it mean that the deal or information about the deal become commodities and may it, it may become less attractive in a way? It's a very smart question. Um, I, I think when everyone starts to know about a deal, two things happen, um, access, uh, you, you need to get immediate access to that deal. Uh, like when I was raising uh, my Series B in 2007, it was a $20 million Series Series B round. I think it took us six months to close that deal. Um, today, that, that deal will be closed in a month, less, right? The average term sheet in the Valley now in a hot deal is is days, you know, for, for a turnaround of signatures on that. So I, I, I think um, what the person posing that question is aware of is that things are accelerating. Um, access is going to be super important. Um, so the ability for AI to reach in, find that hidden gem, find that exact match for you as an investor um, and give you that, that necessary time for you to study the deal, understand the deal, and then get into the deal is going to be absolutely critical. Cur- Access is going to be the currency in venture within the next few, few years. That's the point I was trying to make with Venture 3.0. We're not going to have the time that we used to have to do deals and spend time with the founders and all this stuff, we're going to have to radically ramp up um, the, uh, what we do within the time that we have to do it. AI can certainly help, but all of our processes, um, we need to automate away anything that is that is putting friction into the system and, and, and really, really focus on the core things that we need to find out about those, those hidden gem deals. Okay, thank you, John, um, for the answer to that question. Um, I see a raised hand here, um, Justin Patrick. If uh, Johanna and Aisha can um, help to yeah, uh, put Justin on the, on the stage as well. Hi, Justin, hi, please. Uh, hi, Grace. Um, a question, um, I think it's a question actually for, for both of you. Um, I, I know both of you have done the hand-picked angel investing before, you know, picking that particular company. Um, and, and John, you're, you're an expert in looking at the high volume, very diversified approach. Um, for someone who's looking to, um, to, to do a new investment, um, you know, in, in, in either one of those areas, what do you think the pros and cons are, both in terms of the experience of doing it um, you know, the emotion and the experience of doing it and in terms of the returns you might expect. Such a good question. Grace, do you want to go or do you want me to go? Uh, I'll let you go first, John. So I, I think if for anyone that's doing their first investments um, in, in an angel company, it's a super exciting thing to do, right? Um, you're engaging with founders. You've got a bit of money in your pocket and you're about to put it all at risk on a story that's being told to you across the table. And you're hoping that they don't lose um, lose your money. I would say one of the important things is to really get used to losing money as an angel. Um, get used to, get used to the idea of losing money because it's going to happen. 
And if you're the kind of person that should be sticking with public equities and like yeah, 10% loss, 5% loss, 3% loss, something that's manageable, and you've suddenly got to deal with 100% loss, if you haven't prepared yourself for that, it, it can be really heartbreaking. Now, and now, that said, my accountant actually made one investment in his entire life. Um, he made a $50,000 investment, got a $400,000 return in six months. So he is absolutely not the person that you need to be talking to if you're about to make the first investment because the statistical likelihood of that happening is very slim. So I think you've just got to have really realistic expectations. Be prepared to lose money. And, and if you make money, understand how that money was made. Uh, it was likely market timing or something else that was quite out of the control of either the founder or yourself or anyone else. It's very hard to pick these early stage companies right. Um, so the only way to do it is to make your picks, make your bets and, and see, see what happens. Our strategy is to do a large number of those bets because the, the math for us proves out that that's going, to get, that's going to give you a return that's more of an index style return. It will more closely match the industry returns. Um, but if you're going to make a handful of investments, you know, maybe look at Angel List, find some syndicate there that's, uh, you know, where the guy's doing a good job and getting good returns or team up with a buddy that's, that's been doing this a while. Uh, but be prepared first and foremost to lose money and, and, and just just get into it and start doing it to a point. And you, you, will, you will have some success, but also recognize that it takes a long time for these returns to come back. 10, 12 years is not unusual for, for money to come back. Airbnb. That was 12 years. DoorDash, that was close to 12 years. Um, Uber, that was 12 years. So these are long-term investments you're making at seed stage. So you have to get used to that money sitting somewhere for a long time before it comes back. Grace, what, do you, what would you say? Uh, yeah, I think I totally agree with, um, with what you just um, ex explained to us. In a way that uh, first thing first, I think, is very psychological. Um, you really need to understand your uh, risk appetite and um, after you, you, if you decide you're going to invest in, as an angel investor you're going to invest in an early stage company understand the risk first before you actually engage yeah. and uh, afterwards i think in order for in order to uh, kind of make sure that you know calm yourself down in a way to if you want to invest in a in an early stage company i guess um Talk to people, and uh, also when when things go wrong or things go right, try to um, contemplate on what's what's going on. So make that a learning point. So in, in the future, um, you make better decision, make better investment. And I mean, uh, speaking as a as a junior in the investment team at Tejo Ventures, I think that's something that um, really need to be built up. Uh, I believe more uh, with more experience, more seeing deals, more talking to. Uh, the more you talk to more experienced investor who actually make good bets in the certain companies really help and, and really seeing those companies. So I think it's it's all about um, learning loop, uh, you know, fail and learning loop in a way and also uh, really understand that we're entering a high risk, high return space um, to, you know, be able to make peace with that um, before actually um, entering kind of this yeah, risky space in a way. Yeah, and, and understanding risk. I mean, one of my favorite expressions is is what you know, Europeans call venture capital risk capital, right? Yeah, so we yeah, the French, yeah. But 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 really, it, that puts the wrong spin on it because if you have one ten x investment, that that'll forgive nine failures, right? Um, yeah. So it really is about playing the odds to a certain extent. You, you can't make one or two investments and hope that they're both going to turn out well because there's just so much risk associated with that. The bigger the portfolio, the less the risk would be the, the, the lesson we learned from, from our, our research. But great question, yeah. Justin. Great question, Justin. Thanks. You another one for Thanks us. Thanks for your question. Um, I, I also have been asked by a couple other people if there's time, if there's time, because I don't want to cut off other questions, could you show some of the technology, the platform? Sure. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, Grace, I, I, you're, you're, you're the, the question. Master, yeah. Um, so, but, but, but that would. But I had some, a couple of people ask me for that. So, um, um, why don't we keep the demo um, in the end, maybe? So, okay. um, uh, we have well because we still have some questions here, and um, after that, we can uh, play the demo. Great, great. Um, 
Please release okay. me the video. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Thank you for your question. Uh, yeah, so um, next question. Um, how do you cooperate with the sourcing partners that you mentioned? Uh, for example, an incubator or an angel network? Yeah, so, so, so the way that we co typically cooperate with um, people that originate deals for us is, is we take an unbiased view to the selections that they make. Um, so if they select 10 companies out of 1,000, we'll back all 10 of them, um, and we don't further cherry pick. A and that does a couple of things. Um, if we go in and we say that we're going to invest $50,000 for each of these 10 companies, um, what that means is it, is it de-risks the founders, it de-risks the accelerator because they, they can now rely on us for a bit of cash as well. And, and so generally we find this works really well. Um, a lot of accelerators, you know, they're, 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 they're not geared to make large investments. They're geared to make smaller investments. So when we turn up and we double or triple the size of the cash that can go into the founder's hands, that enables the founder to do more marketing, you know, build more stuff, maybe hire someone, and it, and it puts things on a more, you know, on a more sort of solid basis. So, so typically what we'll do is we'll go, we do our diligence, really significant diligence on everyone that we work with. We have spoken to, I think, 400 accelerators now around the world. There's about 9,000 that exist. Um, so with, there's about 40 that we have cleared for co-investment and we've done investments with about 15 of those so far. So um, there's other people out there doing similar kinds of things, like working with accelerators and incubators. I'm not aware of anyone else that's going out and saying, what you select, we'll put our money in every one of those companies. And, and the reason we do that is because they're selecting at the right ratio. They're do, putting in the work. They're finding good founders. So we have no trouble backing those guys because we understand their process and, and we understand that they're making good choices. So that's basically it. We're, we're first money in, and and you can rely on us to to invest across the cohort, not just in one or two companies. Okay, um, thanks for that answer, John. And uh, speaking of which, we also have a uh, like couple of questions related to due diligence and all the things. So um, yeah. there there are three questions actually, if I may shoot it at the same time. Yeah. So the first one will be. As you are going for quantity, uh, what processes are in place to ensure the quality of the is available on your platform? And uh, the second one will be, how does your automated due diligence work, especially for pre-revenue startups? And um, if you can also briefly share your approach in managing portfolio companies, especially with founders with lacking managerial skills. How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, we have... Uh, what was the first one? Uh, what was the first uh, one? The first one will be uh, the first one is about uh, uh, the processes uh, which is already in place to ensure the quality of the deals because you're going for quantity. Yeah, and quality then the second data, one is about the due diligence. The quality of data, right? So, so basically, yeah. when when someone gives, there's there's some things that founders are not very good at, and one of the things they're not very good at is is figuring out what sector, what industry they're in. And they'll always forever choose something like software because it's just the easiest thing. And, and they may be in, you know, radiology software specific to blood cancer, right? But, but they're choosing software. And, and that's really not helpful for anyone if you're trying to match mandates. So one of the things our AI does is it digs into the, to all the text that we're provided as either part of the description or, or, or the social feeds or the website. And we figure out what they do. And we've got 2,900, I think about 3,000 subcategories now. And so we'll find all those subcategories using AI. And that gives us a much clearer picture of what category the company's in and, and, and what it does. The other thing we test for is we do a lot of data quality testing as a first step. So we test for readability. We test for entropy. Um, we, we test for um, duplicate, duplicate words. We test for amplification words. We test for incidence of co index of coincidence, meaning, you know, is this actually a real language? Yeah, you know, we, we test for all of these things when people submit stuff to us. And what we're looking for is quality of thought. But if someone submits a biotech project to us, we want that description of the project to read at a, at a PhD level. We don't want it to read at a grade three level. That's, that's just a mismatch. So with our data quality, what we're constantly checking for is, is this a match for the type of investment that is being proposed? Do these sound like founders that can pull this off? Are they using the right terminology? And we've experimented with a ton of different ways of looking at this. And I think we've come up with a really good solution now. Just to quickly cover due diligence, 
a lot of the diligence that we do, we, we leave in the hands of our accelerator partners. Um, we provide them with templates and with process that they can follow so that they can go through a one hour Zoom call with the founder and ask all the right questions. And we're happy to share that with anyone that's interested. But essentially what we're doing at the, at the deal, at the application stage is we're saying, if you get a thousand applications, we want to cut that down or help you cut that down to a manageable number of maybe a hundred applications um, that where you're going to choose 10 of those at the end of the day. So what we're trying to do here is, is cut down and find out exactly what's a match for your mandate and then use a process of categorization and data quality analysis to figure out who deserves that Zoom call out of those hundred companies so you can further filter it down to that 10 that you really like. Okay, thank you. So I think that answers the question on the due diligence part. Um, we have just one last question, if we can make it brief so we can show the demo. It was about the portfolio management. How, um, how did you manage um, this portfolio, this large portfolio companies, especially with founders with lacking managerial skills? And also I would imagine, you know, to get to that seed to IPO strategy, you need to have a, that, that's a lot of growth going on. So I think, yeah, if you can share about about that as well. Yeah, so all of our portfolio management is done um, using the, the vast platform, the platform we developed. Um, basically, uh, uh, we, we worked with PwC for a couple of years actually to try and figure out how do you approach a super early startup company in a way that isn't intimidating, is easy to understand and gets you the data you need. And, and so we, we went round and round several different iterations of trying to do that. And in the most recent audit, we found, I think we hit on a really nice approach. In fact, we had a couple of founders write to us and say, that's the best audit experience I've ever had. And so, so, so I think it's possible to do these things if you put a bit of thought into it and you try and look at it from the perspective of the person that you're asking to answer the question. So most of the stuff that we do is automated. All of our valuation reports are instantaneously produced. All our reports for LPs and for investors in our fund, it's click a button and you get a five page glossy report. And all of the information on all of the companies is available online in their individual profiles. So, so it's all about developing technology and continuously developing that to take into account, you know, thing, questions that LPs are going to ask or that you have yourself around the investment. But um, I think we've got to the point now where, we're, where we feel pretty comfortable about the level of information that we're able to pull in. On these companies that I would say it's worth mentioning that it's not just our data we have we have about 60 APIs that we've integrated with over the last couple of years and about 15 to 17 of those are, are databases that we ping off everything from from um uh gotta be careful who I mentioned here um er everything from like Socrata you know in in the uh in the states to uh Clearbit to open corporates to, there's just a whole bunch of guys that we can ping crunch base and get information from. And then what we do is we actually compare all that information that we're getting. We compare the wiki description of a company with the LinkedIn description, with the crunch base description, with the clear bit description, with our description. And we try and figure out which is the, which best, which description is the best quality description for that company. So we're constantly comparing all the data we get from different sources. Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much, John. It's another it's a, another point of view of all this AI, right? It's not about only deal making, but also how to manage it post investment. So that's that's very interesting. Um, so actually, um, just by coincidence, we have a question that will be related to the demo. So I think I hope the demo can right. answer this question. Um, so the question is uh, about. Um, how to build consistent returns through automation technologies and use AI as a tool. So I think this is a very, this is a broad, but uh, very on point uh, for us to also figure out how your tool actually works. And um, yeah, I think we can uh, maybe jump straight to the demo if uh, you can share your screen or sure. is it uh, Aisha yeah. and Johanna? Okay, so it's John, okay. Yeah, and, and, and I think with this demo, um, the th what I would say uh, about automation technologies is really um, what automation does is it just enables you to do a, a lot more in a lot less time. That's really the essence of it. And if you think about what venture capitalists invest in, they invest in efficiencies. Um, that's, that's the only secret here. You're investing in new technologies that do things faster, better or cheaper. 
Um, and, and so what we've built here is, is a platform that enables us to handle a lot more deal flow. So I can, I've got 192 deals that have come in the last few days. I've got eight that have been screened and there's 193 that have been passed or ignored. Um, and there's our portfolio here, which you see here, which is, is 134 deals that we've in, invested in or companies that we've invested in. Um, so this is really the, the heart of what we do. We also do this for funds. Um, we do it for deals that are solo deals that come in through one source, and we do it for deals in which we aggregate deals from a whole bunch of other, other um, folks like you're seeing here on the screen. Like you'll see here, Quake Capital, Sente, and Stadia. Quake is a brilliant VC firm, Seed Stage VC out of New York, um, uh, and one of the world's uh, most active investors and in female founders, by the way. Sente is a very, very smart deep tech um, uh, accelerator, early stage investor out of Chicago. Stadia is an awesome bunch of, uh, of sports stars and, and sports fanatics that have formed a venture group out of St. Louis. And, and so just by mentioning those, those guys here, you can see that basically by, by muxing in all those deals, I'm instantly getting um, a, a lot more volume on here that I can, I can play with. Um, what we try and do here is we try and give access to our investors to more deals than deals that just come through our system. Um, to give you an example, there's about 26,000 deals that have come through our system in the past uh, couple of years. Uh, if I combine that with deals that we use for our data modeling from all of the sources that we get deals from, and I exclude deals that are out of business, then what I can do is I can go in here and I can say, okay, I have a particular mandate um, that I want to look for deals in. And someone in here has been looking for community buying deals in Indonesia, for example. Someone else has been looking at soil carbon measurement. Let's have a quick peek at that. And so if I go here, what we're actually doing here is we're using a very sophisticated approach to, to um, where, where we dimensionalize the text and we try and look at every, um, every company in our database that's going to be a match, um, or that's, that's going to be a strong match for the concepts that are being talked about here. It's not a keyword search. Uh, we're, we're looking at a, at a broad sort of, um, it's really, it's really hard to describe exactly what this does, but uh, maybe I'll just push uh, push search here and we can have a look at it. Um, the, comp the search is designed to get smarter um, in the sense that uh, when the results come up here, I can say, okay, this is a great result. Give me more like this. Or I can say, no, this is not what I'm looking for. Give me less like this. And so that the search, the AI behind the search will actually learn what I like and dislike about what's being um, added here. Now, we asked for soil carbon measurement, Haystack AG supports growers and, as, and global carbon markets as tools for high accuracy, cost-effective soil carbon measurement. That's probably a hit. And that's why it's a 1,000 out of a 1,000 match. And you can see as we go down the list here, you can see that the matches reduce in relevance. Um, this score here, by the way, is our business opportunity score. So this means the deal came to us through our channels. And you can see here on this point, we're looking at Israel, India, Iceland, Denmark, the US, Canada, Sweden, Russia, Australia. So it really is very much a global database. And this is in a very, very narrow area, soil carbon measurement. We're still able to find a ton of stuff um, for investors that would be interested in that, that kind of area. You can input anything into, um, in, into this area here. We we're recently looking at vaping technologies. I'll just take China out of this for, for now. Because there are a lot of vaping companies in China, by the way, as I think many of you might be aware. Um, so, so anything really goes here. What we're going to look for are any companies that are broadly in that area of vaping. And as it turns out, we've invested in one of these companies. Let's take a look. So this is a company out of Philadelphia. I believe it came to us through Quake Capital. And, um, and what you can see here is a description of the company. And you can see here that what we've done is we've done a very sort of first pass analytic on what we think this company is made of. Um, 506 is a passing grade. This is, this is absolutely fine. And so this is a company that we would recommend that you call up and do a Zoom call um, with. All of this text that we produce here on the deal is created by our AI. There's no humans involved. So think of this as really a first pass analysis that would typically be done by a team of people that are overworked and have business plans stacked up beside them. 
what we're doing is we're basically saying, you know, here's a first pass analysis. We think this is a fit for your mandate. Give them a call. Um, all of our profiles have fundraising tabs, um, cap table tabs. They, they all come with, uh, with, with uh, secure data rooms um, where you can go in here and you can find any of the information that you might wish to have um, about the company and KPI tracking as, as well. Um, just to talk a little bit more about what we're doing um, as a company, deal flow is the front end of what we do. We, we enable people to create um, an application process that's customized. So if you're an accelerator or VC and you want to put up a custom application process, we can help with that. We've done an awful lot of study in that area. Um, there is an activity window here that's kind of got a, a news feed. There's a fantastic task uh, management piece that you can use internally. And user analytics allows you to see everything that's going on in the system. Uh, we do event management, facilities management. That's mainly geared towards accelerators. It's really useful stuff if you're managing demo days and things like that. Uh, people management, CRM, mail merge, you know, all of the things, mentor management that you would expect in, in a people management tab. And, and someone asked a question around portfolio. Uh, we're launching a carbon fund at the moment called Carbon Nation. Um, this is a super interesting fund. Um, whenever we add a new fund on here, we can add a VCC in Singapore um, and appoint a manager and, and, and an auditor and an admin for that in less than 24 hours. Um, so all of these funds here, many of them are now being uh, based here in Singapore, and we're, we're using that system quite, uh, quite often. Um, all of the portfolio management tools come with a, a front end that enables you to see exactly where the fund is sitting right now. This is our first fund. Um, you can see the directors of it. You can see how it's doing, and you can see what the IRRs is, what, what, the, what the MOIC is, and you can even create another fund um, here and, and, uh, and jump in and, and, and add a fund to that in the blink of an eye. So that's just a very, very, very short kind of presentation here. Obviously, everyone who is on the platform, oh, this is all OEM, by the way. Um, you can create instantaneously a, a, one of these versions for yourself. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's all white label. Uh, we even have versions in Bahasa. We have versions in Arabic. We have versions in Chinese. So everything we have here can be white labeled and turned into your own portfolio management system and with a tiny little powered by Hatcher at, at the bottom. So that's just a very, very quick walkthrough. Um, we've integrated with a whole bunch of KYC functionality, tracking functionality. Um, and, and of course, you can keep up to date with all of the stuff that that uh, people might be engaging with via social media and, and other forms. So maybe I'll stop there and, and hand it back. You can find a lot more information at our website. Um, and, and here you've said that's my partner, Dan, by the way. Hi, Dan. And, uh, and, and you'll be able to learn more about what it is that we're doing here in some detail on the, on the site. Okay, thanks, John, for, for the demo. I think that's, uh, that was very insightful again for um, everyone here so they have more concrete um, feeling of uh, how your tool is, is, is working and all these things. And so um, I think we're um, pretty much running out of time. Um, but then I um, just want to remind everyone if uh, uh, you want to uh, keep in touch with John and uh, we have Amit also here. Um, there's a link already uh, posted on the chat group um, to book a meeting. Um, just to, if, if you're interested to chat more with John uh, personally, with Amit personally, about Hatcher Plus, please find the link on the chat, um, on the chat function um, and, um, and, and the, on your website. And I think, yes, we can wrap up the evening. We can wrap up the event. Um, thank you so much, John, for, thank for you. sparing Grace, your great, time, for great job, explaining great us. Job, everybody. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, um, thank you so much. And um, yeah, I guess uh, I, I have a great rest of the evenings for um, for all of you in, the, in this Indonesia, Singapore time zone. And uh, we're looking forward to meet everyone in another occasion and again thanks John for sharing with us about Hatcher Plus about um, the Venture 2.0 really insightful I believe for all our participants tonight thank you Grace thank you John bye bye everyone